For once, I'm not in the studio or even on the ground. I am, in fact, in an aircraft flying over the Canary Isles. And one of those islands is of special interest to us, La Palma, because it's here that the world's newest observatory has been set up. The English name for it is the Observatory of the Rocks of the Two Boys. It's a Spanish island, but a very international observatory. And the great new 100-inch or 2.5-meter Isaac Newton telescope is just being brought into operation. What we plan is to show you what it can do, the first time a telescope of this size has ever been used for television. The mountain itself is high, not far short of 8,000 feet, and conditions on its summit are probably as good as they are anywhere in the world, even in Hawaii. There are several telescopes in operation. There's a, a Danish telescope, which measures the positions of stars automatically. There's the Swedish solar tower. There's the one meter or 40 inch cat time telescope. And there is, of course, the INT or Isaac Newton telescope, transferred here from his old home at Hurstmonster in Sussex and given a new and better mirror. And now, for the first time on television, we are going to be able to take part in the commissioning night of a really large telescope. It's getting on towards evening, not long now before we begin our observing run, the result of so many years of preparation with the INT, and it's going to be really exciting. And the INT is impressive by any standards. It's one of the most powerful telescopes in the world, and it is the most up-to-date. The modern astronomer doesn't have to sit for hours in a cold dome, guiding his telescope and taking photographs. Today, everything's electronic, and the picture comes through on a television screen. So an observing run now is very different from an observing run of the past. Paul, it's a great honor to be here on the commissioning night of this great new telescope, and it really is a monster. Will you give us a rundown on it? Yes, uh, starlight comes in through the shutters in the dome roof comes down through the telescope to the primary mirror, which is uh, about at head height here in this circular structure. It's a two and a half meter primary mirror. The starlight is focused back to the, uh, towards the roof, back towards the stars, and then it's intercepted by a secondary mirror, which folds the light back down towards the primary again. The light comes through a perforation, a hole in the primary mirror, to the instrument which is underneath it. Um, and the instrument's built in two planes. The upper plane near the primary mirror is an acquisition and guidance system. And that contains a sensitive television camera which replaces the astronomer's eye in this electronic uh, telescope. Uh, it's the means by which the astronomer looks through the telescope to identify the object he's, he's interested in observing. Uh, he can withdraw that television camera and let the starlight fall down into an instrument underneath in the bottom plane of the uh, instrumentation. That's a spectrograph. Uh, that's a device for dispersing the starlight into a rainbow light spectrum and that spectrum can be recorded by an uh, extremely sensitive television camera um, called the Image Photon Counting System or IPCS for short. Everything electronic. But I see you do make one concession to the past. You do have a finder. We have a finder on the side of the telescope. Uh, it has a television camera attached to it of course. Uh, we use it in the initial commissioning stages of the telescope. Um, and also to monitor the weather and things like that. Uh, perhaps we'll use it this evening. Well, the telescope is there, the sky is clear. Isn't it about time we open the dome? Let's get on with it. Patrick, this is Peter Corbin, who's going to drive the telescope for us Good tonight. Evening. Uh, we should get on, Peter. I'll set up the telescope. I'll set up the instrument. Well, I think we agreed that our first object was going to be the Ring Nebula in Lara. That did. sounds pretty suitable to me. We did, indeed. I have the coordinates here. Uh, right ascension, 18 hours, 51.7. Declination north, 32, 58.1. That's 1950, of course. Okay, Peter, would you slew to it? What do we really know about the Ring Nebula? 
Well, it's a planetary nebula. And that's not really a very good name because a planetary nebula isn't really a nebula and it certainly isn't a planet. It represents a late stage in the evolution of a star like the Sun when the inside shrinks and the outer layers are blown off. It sheds its outer atmosphere, so to speak, and that simply spreads away into space and causes a shell, and that's what we call a planetary nebula. Now, the ring nebula in Lyra, which is quite close to Vega in the sky, has been known now for over 200 years, and you can actually see it with a small telescope, though obviously you need a larger telescope to see its form. It's about 1,400 light years away, and that's some distance. It's now about half a light year across, and of course it's expanding all the time. And the central star is interesting. It's smaller than the sun, it's very dense, and it's very, very hot, with a surface temperature of something like 100,000 degrees. And that, of course, makes it a very blue star, which is interesting. Well, the first thing we can see is uh, the ring nebula on the Finder television. You can see the ring form very clearly indeed. That's right. What we're looking at here is the view through the small Finder telescope uh, attached to the side of the INT, and we're seeing the image uh, recorded by the intensified television camera that's, uh, that's looking through it. It's a straightforward television camera looking at an image intensifier, which enhances the, uh, the faint uh, astronomical objects so that we can see much deeper and fainter than, uh, than, with, than without them, of course. Well, it's now almost in the centre of the field, so let's use the main mirror, the INT itself. Let's uh, switch now to the INT. Not quite centred. But let's uh, trim it up a little bit, uh, move the telescope around so that the ring nebula appears central. That's more or less it, I think. It fills the field pretty nearly. It's terrific. Now, that's building up by the integration principle. Can you better say a bit about that, Paul? Yes, the, um, the television camera in the INT is exactly the same one that's um, exactly the same, same type as the one that's on the, uh, on the television finder. Um, but the signal can be read out, uh, can be stored on the target of the, of, of the television camera. Um, it, the charge accumulated for a while and then uh, read out in, um, in bursts. So instead of reading the signal out uh, 50 times a second, as in a normal television camera, it's, it, it, it's uh, read out much more slowly, and so the, the, the faint light gets a, a chance to accumulate more on the target. Now, not only that, but the, um, but the integrated signal can be fed down into a digital memory, and several of these signals can be uh, digitized and stacked on top of one another to make the picture even clearer. So the picture gradually builds up and becomes clearer and clearer and clearer as time goes on. As it's now doing, in fact. As it's now doing. You can see the form beautifully. There's the central star, a very hot one, and there's another star inside the ring. That's merely a field star between us and the nebula. There's another star outside, too. That's right. The, the star that was responsible for the, for the ejection of the ring um, uh, as a nebula is the one that's identified, identifies itself. It's plumb in the middle of the, of the ring nebula. It says, look at me, look at me, I'm the one that's, uh, that's interesting. Now, this is an ordinary white light. That's right. This is, we haven't got uh, anything between the television camera and uh, uh, the ring nebula except for the telescope. But we can uh, insert between the television camera and the ring different coloured filters, different coloured pieces of glass is all they are. Uh, we can, uh, the astronomer can, can uh, look through these different colours and, and pick out different coloured bits of the ring, different bits of things that are interesting to him. He can do this with uh, nebulae, he can do it with spiral galaxies. He can differentiate between the stars and the nebulae in a spiral galaxy, for example, uh, and he can pick out different excitation bits in a nebula like the ring. In fact, let's do it, shall we? Yes, of course, each colour will show up different things with the ring nebula itself. That's right. Let's switch, first of all, to the blue filter, okay? Right, blue. Now, remember, the middle star, the one that's responsible for the ring, that is a very hot star indeed, it's bluish. That should be the first to show up, and there it is, look. And showing up beautifully. As it builds up, that's, uh, that's quite clearly the, the brightest star on the field, and the, uh, the star which was in the lower left-hand corner has uh, disappeared. So there can't be much, much blue in that. That's right. Uh, it's emitting so little blue light uh, that none of it is passing through the, uh, through the blue filter and, uh, and falling on the, on the camera. So we'll see it better in the red filter, in fact, later on. Before we go to the red filter, though, yes. let's look at an intermediate wavelength band. Let's look at the green one. Yes, by all means. Uh, that looks to me, as it builds up, as though it's giving a larger image than the blue filter did. Now, why is that, Paul? It's uh, also a slightly different shape, I think. Um, it's larger because uh, 
different spectral lines uh, from the nebula, uh, which come from different regions in the nebula, some from regions which are closer in, some from regions which are further out, uh, pass through the different coloured bits of glass and uh, make different kinds of images um, on, the, on the television camera. You can start to see that star again now, the, the one outside the ring, the one we think is a red star. That's right, and uh, if our hypothesis about it being red is right, it, uh, it should be even clearer on the, on the red filter. But the green filter is quite definitely different from the blue. You can see the differences in shape and also the differences in structure. The differences in structure, that's right. The differences in the way the gas is uh, uh, flowing and condensed and, and knotty and twisted are different in the different, um, in the different spectral lines. Let's, uh, let's switch to the red filter now. Yes. Once again, we have the gradual building up process. And the star in the lower left-hand corner is the, is the brightest of all the stars on there, and the, uh, the hot blue central star is uh, much less definite than it was before, uh, because uh, we're seeing it in red light, and the blue star isn't emitting much red light. What about the shape now? The, the shape's become markedly elliptical, hasn't it? Um, that's uh, some consequence of the way in which the nebula was created. It, uh, it, it, it was ejected in an explosion off the star, and the explosion wasn't completely symmetrical. It didn't flow out equally in all directions. Uh, some directions were preferred. For example, uh, it might have flung stuff off preferentially around its equator as it was rotating. It might have flung stuff off, uh, off the equator more easily than out of the poles. So that gives it a, a particular kind of uh, elliptical shape, and it's also larger. What's caused the redness, actually? Uh, the redness is uh, the spectral line H alpha. It's one of the most common spectral lines in the optical spectrum. Hydrogen, in fact. In, in, in ga gaseous nebulae from the Balmer series of hydrogen. And uh, it's uh, a relatively easily ionized atom. And so uh, a even as the radiation from the central star flows further and further away from the star, it can still penetrate into the, uh, in, into the hydrogen and, and ionize it. Well, now, we've been talking about blue and green and red pictures, but what we've actually seen are black and white pictures. I know they've been taking through colour filters, but we've seen no colour yet. So, how, in fact, do you get a colour picture out of that? Well, supposing these were uh, photo photographs, if we'd taken these as ordinary photographs through, uh, through coloured pieces of glass, we would have a black and white photograph in each of these three colours. If we now tinted uh, the photographs, uh, blue and green and red respectively and superimpose them all one two three in a kind of a sandwich that would be effectively the same thing as a, a color transparency as a, as a color slide that after all is a little mechanism which is three uh, kinds of film stacked one upon the other responsive to uh, to red green and blue light so if we take these three separate images stack them one on top of the other electronically in a by video techniques instead of physically superimposing them, then that produces a colour picture. And there it is, a colour video picture from an object well beyond the solar system. And that's something that no one's ever done before. I think this is the first time that anybody's taken a colour video picture of anything uh, outside of planets, Patrick. Yeah. Well, how faithful are those colours? I mean, if you're really close to the ring nebula and having a look, would it really seem like that? No, these aren't faithful colours, these are representative colours. There's, there's a difference. If you were looking at a television monitor, uh, uh, monitoring a camera pointed towards a football match, then what was on the television and the football match would not be identical colours. Uh, the green of the grass on the television monitor would be greener than the green, uh, greenness of the grass in real life, and the football players on the monitor would probably look uh, browner and healthier uh, than they did in real life. But nonetheless, the image is a representation of what's really there, and the colour television image of the Ring Nebula um, is an image and a representation of what's really there in the sky. So these pictures, in fact, can tell you a great deal. They can tell you about the composition of the nebula, they can tell you about the gases there, they can tell you about the temperatures. So you can get quite a lot out of that picture. You can, but you can get more out of uh, spectroscopy. Exactly. And that, that, is, uh, that, 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 of course, is what this telescope's all about. We can use the light that the telescope is gathering to look at, a, um, at, to, to look at an image, or we can flip the mirror uh, w through which the television camera looks up the INT um, to see this uh, image, we can flip that mirror out of the way and allow the, the, the starlight to fall down upon the spectrograph. Uh, we can take that same television camera and look down at the top 
of the slit of the spectrograph and we can see the whole image off the reflected jaws of the spectrograph except for the light which is going inside the spectrograph box. Okay, and let's do that, shall we? And there's the line across it. And that, in fact, is where the spectrum is going to show. That's right. It's a dark line because there's no light coming from it. That light is going into another instrument. It's going into the spectrograph. Uh, if we can now adjust the spectrograph so that it's in the right configuration, then we can actually look at the spectrum from that light that's missing that's going into the instrument. Now, we get to know the status of the spectrograph. We get to see if it's in the right configuration and, um, and the way it's supposed to be by looking at the spectrograph status monitor up here, which is um, nothing less than a, a diagram, a representation um, in logic, if you like, of, uh, of the spectrograph with the light entering from the left, passing through the slit of the spectrograph and into all the apparatus uh, beyond that, and being recorded by the de detector beyond. And this display shows the astronomers who come to use this telescope in, in computer form uh, what uh, the status of the spectrograph is. They can check whether it's the way they want it to be. Uh, the image itself is recorded on the image photon counting system and the spectrum comes up on a, a, a television monitor in just the same way as these ordinary understandable images uh, that, uh, that we've just been seeing. In fact, uh, if you look at the uh, IPCS display monitor, you can see the individual photons which come in onto the display yes. and the uh, uh, accumulation of these photons into an image of the spectrum. And the spectral lines which show up on the, um, on the display are the spectral lines which pass through the sequence of red, green and blue filters and made the images which, uh, which we just had a look at. Now what again does that tell you? Uh, well, uh, the uh, quantitative data in the image, uh, the ratio of the, of the spectral lines, the wavelengths that the spectral lines come from, tells you the composition of the nebula, it tells you its temperature, it tells you its density, it tells you its motions, it tells you all about the physical conditions in that nebula. It's, uh, the, in fact, it, it's the raw material of astrophysics. If, if, uh, if we were a factory and we had a product, uh, one of these uh, spectra would be, uh, would, would be it. That's what we give the astronomers like you who come here to, uh, to, to use this telescope. So in fact, by observing one like this, you can learn a tremendous amount about the makeup and the details of objects many light years away. Yes, this observing run has been a typical observing run uh, by an astronomer. We've set up the telescope, uh, we've uh, adjusted the instrumentation, we've acquired the object on the finder, we've switched to the main telescope, we've uh, taken the image onto the slit of the spectrograph, we've passed the light into the spectrograph, and we've analyzed it. It's a typical observing sequence, and what we've just gone through is in fact a, tip a typical commissioning sequence of a brand new telescope. Uh, this has been a commissioning run. A commissioning run is, is just something where you make a piece of equipment, or an instrument or a telescope, flex its muscles, um, just to show what it can do, and that's what we've been doing today. You've seen what the INT can do. It's the largest telescope here, though by no means the only one. And in the foreseeable future, it will be joined by the even larger William Herschel telescope. Conditions are ideal. The equipment is the most up-to-date ever made. And I don't think there's any doubt that the observatory of the boys is going to lay claim to being the finest in the world. program can be seen again next Saturday afternoon at 10 past 4 on BBC 2.